humans, you have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. Whoa! Murder! It's just a shadow way. It's just a shadow way. Whoa! Murder! <laughs> I can't sing that high. It's just a shadow way. It's just a shadow way. Yeah, all right. How's it going, everybody? You're listening slash watching the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How's it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. And uh, hey, can we ask Terry for more topic ideas? Because this is great. (laughs) Yeah, so this topic is, it comes from our longtime editor, Terry Robertson, who turns out is not editing the podcast anymore. That has been moved on to Craig Blanchett, although Terry's overseeing it, so he's still involved. Nice. But we were having... Yeah. But we were having a conversation, Terry and I, because he's you know, been working with us for a long time and he's Mm -hmm. building commander decks and because he's in LA now, he's sort of playing a little bit more and he was kind of asking me like, can you give me a list of cards that I really need in my collection? You know, cards that are sort of must-haves or the staples in the format that will be good for me to get a hold of. So we're going to run down a list of commander format staples and must-have cards. But before we do that... Oh, also I might mention we do have... Masters 25 preview cards on the episode today. So yeah, we very two. exciting. Two of them. Yeah. So, yeah, we're also going to do that. But before we get into that, mm. we got to call out our sponsor, cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Use that affiliate link when you're ordering all these cards that we're about to talk about. <laughs> and uh, you'll be supporting this podcast, supporting Game Nights and all of our content. We really do appreciate... We get tweets and comments every single day about how awesome Card Kingdom service is, how fast they ship, and we appreciate everybody out there who's using that affiliate link to support this show. Yeah, especially those that just come out of nowhere and email us and be like, hey, thank you guys so much for introducing me to them. Um, That is a genuine, like, that's feedback that I've never seen on any level for a lot. And then we've worked with, I've worked with a lot of retailers and stuff before too. Uh, Another sponsor for the show, Ultra Pro. They just came out with this Relic Token series. We showed it off in the last episode of Game Nights. Uh, Really cool stuff. They're always coming out with new stuff as well. And they have pretty much something to provide for you for every aspect of Magic the Gathering gameplay or just gameplay in general. Even buying Ultra Pro playmats as um, mouse pads is something I do. Oh yeah, they're awesome as mouse pads for like editing and stuff. Oh yeah. Because you can move your mouse so far without running off the mouse pad, which is something that happens. it's on awesome stuff like John Avon art, like these unstable full art lands, which yeah, uh, pretty awesome. These playmats were given a few of them away. Yeah. So, and the final way to support the show is on patreon.com slash command zone. You can contribute directly to all of our content. And in fact, we call out one lucky patron every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to Tom, Tom Ralph. Ralph. Tom, hey. he's been a patron for over a year. Wow. Tom, you rock. You rock. 12 months strong. Uh, over a year. I mean, it might be 13 or 14. I don't know. I didn't write the exact amount, but Tom, <laughs> Tom's been around for a while. Now, a few of you may be here just for this part of the episode, and I don't blame you because it is preview card time, and it's for a very exciting set. Masters 25. It's the newest Masters set celebrating 25 years of Magic the Gathering, and we have two very special cards to preview. Should we start? We should start with this first one first, I think. It's a little less exciting, although it's very good in our format, and I think Absolutely. probably hasn't gotten the love that it deserves it's Ash Barons. It's a land. It comes into play untapped, and it has basic land cycling one, which means that you can pay one, discard the card, and then find a basic land. Yep. And so, put it into your hand. So it, Ash Barons represents a land that you can play if you don't need, if you're not worried about your colors. Like you have all your colors, yeah. you just play the land as a land. But if you are worried about your colors, you just pay one mana, pitch it, and then go find whatever basic land it is that you need at that moment. And the reason it's so good uh, is shown by the price. It's like a $4 and up common that was released in the last Commander set in 2016. So, like, it's a very recent card, but hard to get. That's uh, that's two Commander sets. Two Commander sets ago. Sorry. Yeah. Time flies <laughs> when you're playing Magic. Uh, so, Ash Barons is coming back. Uh, basic land cycling for one. Very good card. Yeah, and this will definitely drop the price on it, which I think is good. And It's a common in a set. Yeah, that's going to be open a lot more than Commander decks. So. I mean, really, this card could go in any three color and up deck. Mm-hmm. that's probably going to make any of those decks a little bit better as far as their mana, the mana base a little bit better. So, yeah, I'm There's really... There's so many times when you just need a color, too. Like, if you're playing yeah. a spell, blue spell deck with a lot of counter spells and stuff, you need two blue a lot of times. Yeah, exactly. I, or, yeah, I need my second red or yeah. whatever. Or I just need red, period. Like, yep. then I can cast my general, that kind of thing. And it goes in any deck because it's colorless. So, yep. uh, really, really good card. Um, Speaking of good cards. Yeah, this next one's pretty exciting. It's 
really gotten up there in price. Yes. And this is going to hopefully bring it down. I don't know. Hmm. I'm not actually sure if I'm excited about that because that means I'm going to see this deck around more. <laughs> this was one of the first commander decks you ever built, Jimmy. Yes. And actually, it's one of the first commander decks we talked about on the show with a special guest as well. Yeah. Marshall Sutcliffe. I think it was episode like seven, eight, nine. Yeah. One of our first 10 episodes. So if you're very familiar with the show, you know what the card is. But That's right. It is. <laughs> Animar, Soul of Elements, making a grand return in M25. Now, this is probably one of the most powerful teamer commanders out there, or just one of the most powerful commanders ever printed. Who I think, knows? like, long ago, it was a tier one deck, and now it's kind of it's tier a little bit. two, but it's still, like, one of the most powerful, probably, like, top 25, top 30 most powerful decks out there. It's got a lot of text on it. It makes it very powerful. So it's a blue, a red, and a green for a 1-1 legendary creature elemental with great art by Peter Morbacher, I might add. It's got protection from white and black. So those are the two colors it is not. Whenever you cast a creature spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on Animar, Soul of Elements, and creature spells you cast cost one less to cast for each plus one, plus one counter on Animar. Oh, man. Reduction of mana cost. That's one of the most powerful things. We always say it. There's a whole bunch of things about this card that make it really, really good because all of the abilities are relevant. Protection from white and black is surprisingly relevant very, very often. All the time. Yeah. So many times it's like, I'm going to swing at you. Like, I'm going to block. Like, nah, no, you nah, can't. you're not. <laughs> you can't. Or you can block <laughs> anything from certain decks because yeah. it has protection from white and black. Or they can't get rid of it because Swords of Plowshares, Path to Exile, yep. things like, you know, Black doesn't play a ton, maybe Murder or Hero's Downfall, but also like Shriek, Shriek Maws Ma, and things. Yeah. yeah, Necrotals, that kind of stuff can't take care of this card, which is totally relevant. Um, the fact that it grows as you play creature spells, Animar is one of the few decks where you actually will see the commander itself like swing and and and, yeah, and kill somebody because it'll yeah. grow huge in one turn, have protection from the color they might be able to block with, yeah. swing in, you're dead. And if you just put some unblockable things on as well, or yep. you put Swift of Boots in the deck. Um, I mean, and, But the funny thing is, we just talked about everything except for the single most powerful thing about the card. <laughs> yeah. you, like, even if you took all the other text off, it would still be amazing with just the last ability. Yeah, you could build it. I mean, like, it may not be a commander, but you would put this in the deck that, like, want, like a, that wanted to use plus and plus encounters. Right, but the last ability, which is creature spells you cast cost one less to cast for each 1-1 one, one counter on Animar means that Animar very quickly gets to the point where it's playing most of its cards for free or like one man. Very close to yeah. it, yeah. So one of the most powerful things you can do is play a card like Palancron. Yep. After you get a few plus and plus encounters in the Animar, and you can pretty easily go infinite because it comes in, untaps lands, and then you pay four man to return to its owner's hand. Then you can just play it again, put another counter on Animar, and repeat the cycle. Uh, cards like Draining Walk are really good because it a, it's a counter spell eventually that, that, that costs blue, blue, and you get a creature that's a huge flash flyer. Yeah. Pretty sweet. It's, I mean, this is one of those decks that you think you've turned it off. You've shut off the valve. Yeah. You've answered what they did. And then, you know, it's turn seven, eight, nine, and they play Animar, play a bunch of stuff all in one turn. And it's like, you didn't do anything. They just recover so fast. Oh, yeah. yeah. This, this next one is the, mo well, there's two, I think, two most broken cards in the deck. And this yeah. is one. Ancestral Statue, which was just this regular common. It's a four mana, three, four artifact creature. Uh, I think from Dragons of Tarkir. Yeah, it says when it enters the battlefield, returning a non-land permanent you control to its owner's hand. You can just essentially play Ancestral Statue when the animal is at four counters. Or even play at three. Yeah. You can play it for free because it's colorless and you can just start flickering. It, it can back. bounce itself. Yeah, over it doesn't and over say and over again. It's not return another yet. creature. Yeah, it's just a non-land permanent you control. So you play it target itself back to your hand and it's still free as long mm -hmm. as Animar has four counters you play it. And so that's going to make Animar infinitely big. Infinitely big or arbitrarily large as we say. Uh, as, as soon as like turn probably like five or four i don't know i mean like you can do this really quickly like you said if animar has three counters and you play it for one it's now going to have four and you can yep. go off there yep. yeah so you can really do this on possibly turn four it's possible yeah um cloudstone curio is the other one mm -hmm. which whenever you play a creature you can bounce another one of your creatures and then you play that creature and bounce the creature you just played and if you have two creatures that are basically free um you can go infinite in sort of the same way as ancestral statue yeah this works really well in Okay, spoiler alert. The next Game Nights. In the next Game Nights, Jimmy plays an Animar deck. Oh. But it's actually based off of our good friend Vinny, who is a Game Nights alum. Um, he has an Animar Morph deck. So the way Morphs work is you can play them face down for three mana, and they're 2-2 yeah. two, two creatures. With Animar, 
that means that very quickly, NMR only needs three counters before you're just playing more for free. You still have to pay to flip them up, but it makes all of your creatures playable for free, basically. Cloudstone Curio on that deck, obviously, extremely uh, yeah, extremely powerful. So the Morph Animar deck is actually one of my favorite decks. It's just so cool. And it yeah. does something creature decks normally can't do. It has a lot of surprise and a lot of versatility to it. And it kind of powers down Animar a little bit because there are a lot of very broken builds with this. Uh, you can go back to Marshall's deck. He has a very optimized and pretty powerful build with this deck. You know, trying to get like Farhaven Elves and a lot of ways to ramp out spells and stuff really, really quickly. The Morph deck's just fun because you get to flip stuff up. It's still very powerful. People. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still very, very powerful. <laughs> it's just not like tier one powerful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, Jimmy plays that on the next game night. So that's something to look forward to. We won't spoil how that ends. All right, let's move on to our main topic which is commander format staples and the must-have cards in the format. We're doing something a little different than because we normally rank cards sort of best to worst or whatever, but on this one, I tried to do it as sort of the best bang for your buck, as right. it were. So I tried to take into account sort of how valuable the card is because some of these can get kind of up there in price. And, you know, we've talked about on the show many times, like, hey, you don't need this card because... It's expensive, and you don't have to have it. You can get an alternative. Yeah, there are a lot of... Yeah. Yeah. So something like Force of Will, very expensive card, and extremely powerful. At the same time, when you're starting out, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to go get Force of Will, because there's Swan Song. Even just regular Counterspell is a pretty good alternative to Force of Will. Mm -hmm. Is it as good? No, of course not. But you don't need to ratchet your power level all the way up to 100 right away that's something you yeah. do later after every other card in your deck can't be improved now you're looking to make those small improvements to, to to sort of certain slots and you can make the upgrade yeah you wouldn't spend a ton of money on the mana drain as opposed to a counter spell when you could just when you get, don't have when you could get like 30 other cards you know for your deck for the price of one but there are certain cards that i believe even though they're maybe a little bit spendier and we're not talking like 200 dollar cards we're talking like mostly 20s 20 30 yeah, yeah um are worth it not because not only because they'll make your deck more powerful, but also because you can use them in so many decks. Yeah. And so these are kind of the cards that like every commander player worth their salt sort of has in their collection. Um, and we're going to try and give a roadmap of, and this was part of the conversation with Terry, a roadmap of like, here are the cards, if I didn't have them in this order that I would try to obtain it, just to sort of make the power level of my collection and my ability to, you know, make better commander decks overall yeah you know not a specific deck just like i want to build better commander decks plural um this is the cards i would get and this is sort of the order i would get them there's something i want to talk about really quick before we go into the specifics and it's a system that Vinny uses same guy that built the morph deck I yeah about earlier so Vinny uses a, a checklist card system it's super super smart it actually was adapted from phil de luca who's one of the co-hosts of the commander and podcast he had a binder system. Mm -hmm. And the way Phil does it is he has a binder with all the staple cards in it. So he might have, I don't know, Mana Crypt in there. And he doesn't want to put a Mana Crypt in all of his decks because it's a very expensive card. He has like 20 decks. But what he can do is every time he pulls out a deck, he can grab that Mana Crypt out of the binder, put it into the deck, and then when he's done playing it, he can take the Mana Crypt out, put it back in the binder, and then grab the next deck. And as long as he's sleeved all of his decks in the same exact sleeves he can sort of switch cards in and out and so for each deck he might have three four five cards mm -hmm. that he's putting in now that does create a certain amount of time every time you play and human error yeah kind of factors into it as well sometimes you'll forget a card in the deck yeah exactly you didn't put it back in the binder now or you, you put too many cards it. in yeah. yeah um so Vinny sort of adapted this system to a checklist system so what Vinny does is he builds a deck and in the deck for the cards that he only owns one copy of but he wants to put that one copy in multiple of his decks, he puts a checklist card and he kind of like writes the uh, the name of the card on the checklist card. So he might have Sensei's Divining Top. And so when he draws Sensei's Divining Top, it's on the card and he plays it and then he goes and he opens a little box he's got and he puts the Sensei's Divining Top out onto the table. Yep. And now at the end of the game, he can just put that back and the checklist and, card stays yeah. in. So he still has a 99 on card deck. And this you'll you'll see this happen a lot in pro play as well with actual checklist cards, cards that can flip over, like, for instance, Kid Jace for a while. So they'll play the card, and then they'll find it out of their little deck box, put it on the battlefield, so that way when they need to flip it or do anything with it, it they'll need to unsleeve it, pull it out the sleeve or whatever. So 
for Vinny, this is more just like, look, I have one card. I don't want to buy eight Divining Tops by using all of my decks. So I'm going to have this card, and when I play it, I just take the card out and put it on top. And for all intents and purposes, it is exactly the same as putting the card in your deck, just without having to buy multiple copies of it for each deck. It's great. Yeah, and what I like about Vinny's system is that there's no time. It doesn't cost... Like, with Phil's system, it's good, too. But the problem can be, like, he's like, hold on, I got to switch out all these cards. And so everyone's sort of yeah. sitting there. With Vinny's system, no one's ever sitting there. You're just... oh. Puts it out. It sends a divining top. Everybody even knows what it does and how much it costs. Yeah. So he just plays it and passes turn. And while he's looking for it, somebody else is going. Nobody's cost any time. And then in between rounds, when he's switching decks, he doesn't have to do anything. He just puts that card back in the box, shuffles his deck as normal, and goes on with his life. And then when he draws Sensei's divining top with his new deck, it's the same thing. Checklist card, bump. And if he doesn't draw those cards, it never comes up and it doesn't matter. Yep. So there is a lot of advantages to just owning a single copy of cards rather than i mean jimmy and i are lazy let's be honest so you know i don't want i'm a collector too so i like gameplay sets of things so so i have have like 20 vidalcan orries because i have 20 commander decks but you don't have to do that like Mm -hmm. honestly that doesn't make a ton of sense no it doesn't i mean it's obviously a great budget way of doing it some people are obviously completionists and want to have each deck be fully ready and not have to have like a separate system it's entirely up to you but we're going to be mentioning a lot of cards on this and if you're a new commander player starting out this would be a great way to buy one something of a staple and be able to use it in multiple decks yeah and i think the cards that go in multiple decks it's actually worth it to obtain that one copy even though maybe it's a little bit spendy um you know, spendy is relative, right? $5 to somebody might be a lot for a card, and for somebody else, it might be nothing at all. Yeah. So it's hard for us to sort of talk exclusively on that axis, but we did consider it. Okay. That hit you in the it head. hit me in the head. It did. I hit myself in the head. Nice. All right. So the f- top 12 cards, the first 12 cards we're going to talk about are all colorless or non-color specific. And we will not be mentioning Soul Ring. Yeah. We, we all, we get it. It's Soul in, Ring. It's in every single Commander product. If yes. you are Number starting one. a commander collection, the first card you should obtain is Soul Ring, but I'm assuming that you already have it. So um, so why are we starting with non-color specific or colorless cards, Jimmy? Well, I mean, we want to appeal to the broadest audience possible, obviously. And, you know, these are cards that are not only good again in every deck, but are pretty much cards you want to have in every deck. And it doesn't, I don't think, make a ton of sense when you're doing this kind of kind of exercise like Terry is, where I'm trying to increase my collection overall yeah. and give myself the most flexibility for... To you know, start with. Yeah, colors. if you start with like a green card, well, now you have to build a green deck. Whereas if you bought a very good card that was colorless, now any deck you build, it has a chance to be in it. And most mm-hmm. of these cards could pretty much go in every deck. Now they'll be better in some and worse in others, but they're never going to be embarrassingly bad in like most yeah. decks. Um, so the first, the number one card, I think, if you don't have it, that you should probably go out and obtain, and it will make like 90% of your decks better just putting this card in, is Sensei's Divining Top. Yep. I know a lot of people don't like the top uh, because it's a li- it can be a little bit annoying to play against if somebody is not used to using it and they're kind of slow with it. But undoubtedly, it is extremely powerful, very efficient, and... Anytime you play it in a game, you have an advantage. Also, the only way to get better at playing it faster is to play it. And we did do an entire episode called How to Play Faster, where yeah. we, we spent quite a bit of time just talking about top and ways to make top sort of more palatable and faster to play in a group. A lot of it has to do with leniency uh, around the table, about allowing the person happens, yeah. to... Yeah, we do this all the time with the top... Uh, we should talk about the top. It's a one mana artifact. You play it, you can pay one mana, and you can look at the top three cards of your library and then rearrange them however you want and put them back on. So you don't draw any of those cards with that ability. You just sort of get to choose which one you're going to draw next. Or you can sort of stash cards like, oh, that card costs eight mana. I yeah. don't want that right now, but I still want it later. So I'm just going to push it towards the bottom. I'm never going to draw it yet until I can actually cast it. And the second ability on top is you can tap it, and then you basically exchange it for the top card in your library. So it's in play. You put it on top of your deck and then draw the card that was on top of your deck. So in yeah. emergency situations, and you'll see this a lot, where like somebody's about to win the game and you're like, well, I'm going to top and see if there's a counterspell there mm, or something that yeah. stops this. And then I'll be able to draw it with top and play it. 
More importantly, anytime someone tries to target your top with removal or plays a Vandal Blast overloaded, you can protect your own top by putting it on top of your library and drawing a card with it. Yeah, it's so very... It protects itself. It's very hard to get rid of. And another thing with the top is it's very, very good with library shufflers. So fetch lands are sort of the most common one because you go find a land in your deck and then you shuffle your library. So what you can do is you look at your top three cards with the top and then you sort of say, well, I don't like any of those. So if I have a library shuffler, I can shuffle my deck mm -hmm. and now i got new three cards on top of my library and i can use the top to therefore sort of give myself better selection of my deck in its entirety in a weird way so and again it's very good with the jalevas and the narsets and things of the world that care about what's on top of your library just to know what's there order yep. it so that you get what you want but even not in those decks even at just the baseline level even if you don't have a lot of fetch lands in the decks Top is very, very good because it makes sort of in a weird way, it makes your seven card hand a 10 card hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have access to at least one of the top three cards. Just even knowing what's coming up is really powerful. Uh, and again, the shuffle effect is probably the most powerful part about it. If you have any way of shuffling your library and then being like, hey, here's the problem on the board. Top three cards don't deal with it. Great. This is a perfect time to shuffle those cards away and hopefully find new ones with the top. It also allows you to sort of even out your draws, maybe keep slightly sketchier hands, although we talked about this earlier, be careful with that. But still, you can make some decisions because you have the top, and that's going to allow you more flexibility. Yep. I really believe that top will make, if it, let's say there's a mythical world where X amount of, you know, 50% of decks don't have Sensei's Divining Top in it. Of those 50%, I bet 90% would be better if they did have top. Yep. There's very few decks that just wouldn't be better with it. So that's the first card we would recommend to go get. The second one, number two on my list, is Strip Mine. This card's always good. It, There's always something that you want to destroy with Strip Mine. Lands are so powerful in our uh, format, and they just got more powerful because they printed all these flip land things. There's yeah. another guy has created now. There's a Tolarian Academy, basically, basically uh, reprint in Storm of the Vaults. Not to mention the actual Guy's Cradle, um, yeah. Cabal Coffers, uh, Herborg. Yeah, you know, Sarah's Sanctuary. Sarah's Sanctum, yeah. Sanctum. Um, a million, a million, Maze of Ith sometimes can really, Glacial Chasm can cause you huge problems. Strip Mine is a staple and a card that I put in basically every single deck. And yeah, it costs you almost nothing. You can tap it to add colorless mana to your mana pool, or you can tap it to, track, to sacrifice and destroy target land. It doesn't have restrictions on it. When you destroy the land, it doesn't let the owner search up another card to replace it like Ghost Quarter does. It's very hard to counter. I mean, you need like a stifle or something yeah. like that to And do in it. general, people don't really play land destruction effects in uh, EDH unless they want to be the Armageddon person. So having the ability to destroy lands is very powerful. Not to mention if you play a Crucible of Worlds in your deck, then Strip Mine gets way, 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 way better. Also makes you no friends. But again, very powerful card. Just um, the next time you're playing Commander, look around the table, you know, around 8, 9, or 10, and just think to yourself, would it be useful to be able to destroy at least one land right now? And I guarantee the answer is almost yeah, always going to be yes. Almost always, yes. And there's yes. just so much stuff out there. And oftentimes it's like, I can't win because of a Maze of Ith. Or like, wow, no one's attacking him because he has a Maze of Ith. Dang, that's really powerful. Yep. Glacial Chasm, I don't know how many games I've played where the person's like, I can't beat that card. I just don't have anything in my deck that could do anything about that. Yeah, and by the time it kills them, they'll have killed me. Yeah. Um, all right, number three. Solemn similar, Simulacrum. Simulacrum. I feel like every time I pronounce it, someone tells someone me I pronounced different. it wrong. Solemn S. SS. Sad Robot. Sad Robot. Four mana for a 2 2 artifact creature. Golem, when it comes to the battlefield, you can search your library for a basic land card, put that card on the battlefield, tap, and shuffle your library. So, at the very minimum, it's a four mana card that ramps you one basic land. However, when this card dies, you also get to draw a card. That's pretty good. Oh, yeah. It's extremely good. And it's extremely good partially because it does something that most colors have problems with. Yeah. You know, that that aren't green right exactly green's the one color that can sort of do what this card does which is go find a land with an etb effect everybody else really can't do that that's four of the colors that are taking advantage of sort of the the ramp and the color fixing by solemn and then also it draws you a card when it dies so yeah it it basically drew you two cards probably prevented some life if it blocked depending on your deck maybe you suited up with something and it actually does something it, it just it's that card can go in every deck. Now, there's some decks where it's better and some where it's worse, but it's never like a card that you're like, what is Solemn doing in that deck? Anytime he plays, plays a Solemn in any deck, you're like, yep. Well, 
even in board wipes, it's like, hell, you get a, a card yep. replacement. You get a free blocker. You get, I mean, like in the mono red deck, Solemn's just great. So I, I like this card, obviously, in a lot of decks. Some decks don't want it as much. Decks like Animar love this card. Imagine yep. playing this thing for free. Oh, my goodness. Goodness gracious. Goodness gracious me, oh, my. Uh, number four is a card that is extremely powerful. It's Lightning Greaves, and it just wins games, by the way. I've seen this card just win you the game yep. a few times. Uh, it's a two-mana artifact equipment, and it just says equipped creature has haste and shroud because equip cost zero. That's kind of the big thing because a lot of people will say Swiftfoot Boots, and I think Swiftfoot Boots is good but in a totally different category. It's yeah. not even close to as good as Greaves because the equip cost is zero. Yep. Now you do need to... Now Shroud's a little different. You can't target your own creatures with stuff, so after you equip Lightning Greaves on it, you can't equip something else on it. Which Unless means, you have another creature, you can right. slide the Greaves over since it's free to the other creature, then equip the thing you want onto the main creature, then slide the Greaves back. There's a moment in there where it's kind of exposed and it could be Swords of Plowshares or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, Greaves is... I mean, we're in a format where the commander is more important than ever because they changed the tuck rule. And so lots and lots of decks, Animar, are just built around their commander existing and staying on the battlefield. Yeah. And Lightning Greaves is a really good way to guarantee that the commander stays around. And so it's a pretty good bet that your average deck is going to want their commander to be protected. Not every deck, mm -hmm. again, but that's where we come into the sort of bang for the buck thing where it's like, if you get Lightning Greaves in your collection where you didn't have it before, the chances that you'll use it are very high. Um, the next card is... Unless you have a zero creature base deck. But yeah. even then... Even then, like Mizzix? Yeah. I like Lightning Grooves in that deck because I don't want Mizzix to die. Yeah. I just want it to be harder to kill Mizzix. And the cost point is so low because it's basically two mana. Mm -hmm. And then it just equips for free. Um, yeah, I even put it in decks where I don't... The commander itself is not that important, like my Tim deck. The commanders, now that's partner commanders, I don't care if they die or not. Right. But I want my Tim stall have haste. Not to mention you can give it haste, switch it, give it haste, yes. switch it, give it haste. So if you I know. if you play three creatures in the turn, you can just slide the lightning greaves, use it, slide the lightning greaves, use it. Yeah. It doesn't obviously work quite as good on attacks because you can only attack with one of them, but that's still awesome in a lot of decks because if you're going to play something big all of the sudden, you want to use it right now. Um yeah, there, yeah, there have been so many times being like, oh, we're going to be safe for one turn, and then you play Lightning Greaves, and it goes, oh, we're not safe anymore. Yeah, and and that's a good thing to do with Lightning Greaves is hold it. Yeah. Is not play it out. Is be like, oh, on turn you know seven, I'm going to play Greaves and the creature, same turn, equip, go, and you know it's a tolly or whatever, and yeah. that's going to totally swing the game in my favor. So, yeah. Um, okay, we're down to card number five. Best bang for your buck. Must have. Format staples, in case you, you know forgot the topic. And we've talked about it already on the show multiple times yeah because it's so good it's maze of ith so maze of ith is a land it says you can tap it untap target attacking creature prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to and dealt by that creature this turn so it's it's a it's a removal spell most commonly mm -hmm. um and like you said earlier it's a deterrent spell in a lot of ways too so there's an interesting dynamic that happens all the time in Commander and Maze of Ith really takes advantage of, which is like, let's say, I don't know, Jimmy's got something something big and scary or something, you know, like a 6-6 six, six flyer. I don't know. Just something that's like, or like a Gisela, Blade of Gold Knight or something, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's going to swing in. It's going to do a bunch of damage. I don't want it to do damage to me. Obviously, Maze of Ith can stop that from happening because it'll untap the creature. But so, so often, in fact, I'd say like 80% of the time, the fact that you have Maze of Ith actually means that the person won't attack you. Because they're not going to get anything off it, right? Yeah, because if I attack, if I attack, you know, Jimmy, and he Maze of Ith is my G Gisela, Gisela did nothing this turn. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I just instead attack Craig, he doesn't have Maze of Ith, it'll hit him and do 10 damage. And then, you know... I got to do something. But the upside of that is that Jimmy's Maze of Ith deterred Gisela from attacking and now deters the next player from attacking with their creature because he didn't have to use it. Yeah. And oftentimes people, I mean, even, here's the thing, it untaps the creature. So it's like, okay, cool. At least my creature's not tapped if I do attack with you and force you to use it. A lot of times though, that person just goes on to attack someone else unless you're a clear and obvious threat to the table, in which case it's like, we have to make him use the Maze of Ith. In order to it's get hard to get a table in. to a, to a sort of agree to that. Yeah, and it doesn't always line up that way, right? It's not always like the Maze of Ith is often played as a defensive spell. It is a defensive spell. And so you use it that way too. And it's not like you're, most of the times I've seen it used effectively is not when like, I'm winning so hard that I need this Maze of Ith so I don't die in the crackback. 
in most cases, it's like if you're winning that hard, you're just going to win the game. And Maze of Ith is just a good card in that case, but it's not it's not is what it's not going to save your life in that instance. It's a card that sort of incrementally slows down how fast you die too. Yeah. Just by deterring attacks and things. And so in decks that just sort of want to survive. And what do we say, I don't know, a few episodes ago, like prioritizing survival is a really good way to win a lot of commander games. Mm-hmm. It's just trying to live, not trying so much to like do stuff um, or like, you know, kill other people. Exactly. Um, yeah. Very powerful card. The, there is another use of it too, that you see sometimes, which is like, let's say I have like four or five creatures, but Jimmy has one really big creature. Normally, you don't want to attack because I'm going to lose one. I'm going to do some damage. But Maze yeah. of Ith can actually Maze of Ith your own creature. That's the one that got blocked. Yeah. So the other ones get through. Yeah, because it's not removing them from combat, which is interesting. Um, also, a lot of times when you swing out someone, it'll be like, I have a 2-2, two, two, a 3-3, three, three, and a 10-10. Ten, ten. Yeah. It's like, all right, well, I'll stop the 10-10, ten, ten, and I'll take five. So Yeah, so it prevents a ton of damage. It's a really good card. Uh, again, there are very few decks that wouldn't be better if they have Maze of Ith if they don't currently. And I would say, hearkening back to a past episode... Um, just to reiterate this point, cards like Maze of Ith, it's a land, but it doesn't tap for mana. Don't count it as a land in your deck. Count it as a spell in your deck. It's yes. a removal spell. It's yeah. I count it as a pinpoint removal spell so, similar to Swords of Plowshares or Path uh, of Exile because it's going to effectively remove one creature. Now it's going to switch which creature it's removing. Yeah. And like I said, it has the ability to remove multiple creatures by just deterring. So it's even better than Swords and Path sometimes. Um, but don't count it as a... Well, it's repeatable. That's that's the nice yeah. part about it. All right. Uh, number six on the list. Uh, these are still... These have colors in them, but they're not color specific in general. They're called shock lands. So <clears throat> these are important for a few reasons. One, they can fix your mana. They'll tap for either one color or another. So blue and red, red and green, yada, yada, yada. It's for every color pair, there's a shock yeah. land. And you have a choice when they come into play. Either they come into play tapped or you take two damage and they come in untapped. Thus, shock. They shock yeah. you. Um, but more importantly is if you look at the text line of what kind of land it is, it'll say land dash and then mountain forest or swamp island. And that makes it that much better because this means that now you can actually fetch these with a card that looks for a land type, not necessarily basic land. So fetch lands, for instance, if you had a blue and black fetch land, you could find a blue red land with it because it has island in the subtitle or whatever that line of text is called. So very important to have in general if you are trying to fix your mana for any color deck, any deck that has over three colors. Um, and more recently, they re- they printed a new cycle of lands that we call the Have Lands, which come into play untapped. Uh, no, yeah, tapped unless you control two or more basic lands. So, but the important thing is they also have this line of text that says Mountain Forest or whatever else on them. Yeah, like Cinder Glade, Smoldering Marsh are a couple examples of that. And there was a new cycle of Amonkhet cycle lands and like fetid pools, irrigated farmland um, that they come into play tapped, but you can cycle them away. So if you have too many lands and you don't need any more lands, you can cycle them and draw a card. Um, But they do have the basic land types on them. They have like, you know, uh, Plains Island or something. Yeah, Swamp. Yeah, this is very important. Um, The shock lands are sort of the most efficient bang for your buck way to go about it because... Mm -hmm you're going to want to be able to build as many decks as possible. And one of the things that's going to stop you from doing that is mana base. You know, if you don't have certain, you know, lands, it's going to be tough to build certain decks, especially like once you get to like four and five color, but even three color can be tough because you're just going to run into a problem where too often you can't cast your spells or you're playing too many lands that have to come into play tapped. So I think it's really important to invest at some point in, and get like you know at least one of each of the shock lands and that'll just allow you to build any deck that you want to basically yeah um so i think that's a really important sort of step in the process of sort of building your commander collection up to the point where like okay i can build you know some version of any deck i want to now will i have every single of the best card for that deck no but i can build a functional version you know being able to make the mana base work is really important yeah these are tough too because i don't you don't see these as checklist cards very often but they could be if you wanted to uh but they they do get a little pricier so just as a, a i mention, think they're yeah most of them are like 10 to 15 yeah. somewhere in that range but if you're buying a lot of them you know yeah. but i would say you know again we always say look there are a bunch of tri lands out there that cost 50 cents to a buck there's just a bunch of lands that come into play tapped to give you two colors and maybe give you a life. So don't feel awful if you can't afford a bunch of shock lands. I would still definitely prioritize stuff like 
the strip mine and the Cincy's Divining Tops of the world first. I would also say, like, when we're talking about these cards, you know, it's great to go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone and okay. order them directly. But it's also good to sort of, over time, trade for them. Yeah. You know, trade out some of the cards that are less versatile, you know, some of the ones we're not mentioning today, and trade into cards like Shocklands, uh, you know, and these other things that you're going to be able to use very often. And if you switch decks or get tired of that deck, that Shocklands still going to be great in yeah. whatever deck that you do build. So Sell old cards, turn them into Shocklands. These are cards that will always be relevant, always be good. You see them in Modern for a reason. You'll never you know. be like, man... I got this shock land, dang it. Yeah. What, what a waste. What a waste. I'm going to do yeah, with this I'll never thing. use this thing. <laughs> um, all right. We're on to number seven on the list. Um, it's We cheated a little here. I cheated a little here. It's Felwar <laughs> Stone and the Signets. Two mana rocks. Yeah. Rocks that cost two mana and create colored mana. Um, and I also put in parentheses, I would prioritize the Signets that are non-green. You know, Rakdos Signet, Boros Signet, those kinds of things. Now, now the green ones are still can be played and are good, but in general, green has other ways to do this same thing, whereas Boros does not. <laughs> no. You know, if you're in red-white, for two mana ramping, you know, you don't have a ton of options. Felwar Stone's one, Thought Vessel, there's a couple, but in general, the Signet is going to be, a. you're going to have to play that card. I mean, there's not very many Boros decks or Rakdos decks that just don't play the Signet. Yeah. Signets are, I think, very powerful, especially when we talked about this too. If your commander is a four mana commander, if you play Signet on turn two, that means you can play your commander on turn three. We if should you, say, uh, sorry, Felwar Stone will tap for any color mana that a land your opponent controls will mm -hmm. produce. And Signets are just in every two color pairing. So you pay one, tap the Signet, and then you get two colors of mana. And it'll be like either blue white or red mm -hmm. white or red black, depending on what the Signet is. They're good. Mana ramp is also very important in general. So these are by far the best ways to go about it. It's an, it's a very easy thing to collect. It's not a huge price point. Yeah. Um, and again, it's one. Let's like the shock lines. You're never going to be like, man, what am I ever going to do with this signet? You'll you'll, you'll use find. it in most decks. Yeah. 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 Many many uses for that. And again, if you have the Felwar Stone, the signets, and the shock lands, mm -hmm. you you can build basically any mana base that you want to. Yeah. Um, any three or four color mana base, you're going to be fine with those cards. Now, the thing that will sort of take it to the next level, and you alluded to this earlier, and this is number eight on our list, are the fetch lands. And by fetch lands, we're talking about the fetch lands. Well, there's different kinds of fetch lands, right? Evolving wild, wilds is a fetch land. Right. But the problem with evolving wilds is that the land comes in that you go get comes into play tapped, and, and also you basic. have to get a basic land. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's a there's a cycle of all ten fetch lands that cost you one life when you use them, and they'll go find a land of a of a land type. So it'll say go find either a forest or a swamp. And like you said earlier, this allows you to actually go find a shock land that has mm -hmm. swamp on it. It doesn't have to have forest and swamp. So you could find the you know. I don't know the breeding pools, which yeah, you know, with one that that's only supposed to find an island, but it's going to find you green mana that way, and so the combination of shock lands and fetch lands together make your fetch land basically be able to go get you any color of mana. Yep, and uh, Cons of Tarkir was the last time it was printed in a standard set. They had all of the allied colors, so like blue and white, black and uh, red. And I then think it was enemy. Oh yeah, you know it was blue, uh, yeah. blue black. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then in M seventeen. Uh, Modern Master 17 yeah. is when they reprinted the enemy shock lands. And so the pricing is going to be a little different. Again, these cards are very played in every format that can play them because, again, being able to fix your mana for that cheap of a cost is very effective. So they're going to be, again, on the higher price point. But, you know, it seems like Wizards does want to make sure that more of them get out into the wild because it is a huge barrier for entry for a lot of their formats. And these are very important as well in Commander. So. Yeah, and I would say go after the cons fetches first. They're a little bit cheaper. Yeah. The um, ones from... Uh, Modern Masters 17, that's like Scalding Tarn and stuff like that. They are quite a bit more expensive, but you can still find wooded foothills and stuff yeah. for, you know, reasonable prices. And again, trade up for these, you know, like yeah. bring in old cards. You can use uh, Card Kingdom as a great uh, like system that can buy back cards from you. Turn them into better cards. Yeah, turn them into cards that are going to be better long term for you. Like yeah. something right now that's hot and standard, but isn't even playable in EDH is great to trade in, you know, to Card Kingdom or whatever, and turned it into a Wooded Foothills. I'll also say that you often see fetch lands played sort of, quote-unquote, outside their color. So somebody might play like a Simic deck, a green-blue deck, right. but have Wooded Foothills in the deck because 
for that same reason, it's always going to go find their breeding pools in that deck. It's mm-hmm. always going to find, you know, and so they just have multiple breeding pools basically in their deck. And and breeding pools is the uh, shock land that's green blue. blue yeah. And in a green blue deck, that's your best land besides command tower probably. So you just want to have more ways to find it. Yep. Uh, not to mention they also find the old school, very original dual lands. And you can play off color fetches in your deck. I know there's a little controversy about this because they don't actually show the colored mana symbol in the text. It just says find a swamp or an island. It doesn't say the swamp sign or the island sign. So very versatile fetch lands, um, even more so than signets in a lot of ways because you can play them in pretty much any deck that has at least one of the colors that they can fetch up. Yeah, I would say they're definitely more powerful than signets. It's just bang for your buck, the the, yeah. the price point sort of, they're quite a bit more expensive. So I would get the signets first and then the fetch lands. Yeah. And that's why I would get the shock lands before I'd get the fetch lands because fetch lands are quite a bit worse if you don't already have shocks. Mm-hmm. So, all right. <clears throat> on oh to boy. number nine, which is our one of our favorite cards, a pet card of the show. And to play on the show. Game yeah. Nights. And I think Jimmy and I, we've just got to the point where it's basically in every deck we own. Yeah, and mine are all now foil. <laughs> just have to throw that in there. Yeah, I, have right. a, I have some foils, but I have 20 decks, so you some want, of you them. You trade? For what? The foil ones, I'll take them. For your foil? Yeah, no, 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 no. I'll give you a regular one and like something else. No, what? I don't know, you don't care What's about What's the foils. something else? A card that will, you know, of course, equal or maybe even surpass the value yeah. if added onto the original. I might think about it. We're live trading on the show now. Yeah. <laughs> so the next one is Vidalkin Orrery. It's a four man artifact. It just says you can cast spells as though they had flash. Non land spells. Yeah. Sorry. Well, yeah. lands aren't spells. Right. Um. So it turns everything into an instant, basically. Yep. Powerful as heck. So great. Sorceries as instants. There's a reason they were made into sorceries, right? If they became instant, they would be absurdly powerful. Vidalkan Orrery just ups the power level on every single one of your cards in your deck simultaneously. It's absurd. If you haven't had Vidalkan Orrery on the table, I think it's easy to sort of discount how powerful this is. But And there, there are, of course, moments where it's hard to play because it doesn't do anything when you play it. Yeah. But if you can find that spot where you play it, it's quiet enough on the table, and you get to untap with it, as soon as that happened, you feel so good. You feel in command of the game. Yeah, you can do whatever you want when needed. You don't have to, you don't have to guess about what might happen. You can just wait till it's going to happen and yeah. then respond. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. It's almost like you're playing like a dungeon master, where it's like everyone take your turn now, and you look at your board and you look at what you can do. It's like, all right, let's summon this, this, and this. Yeah, you know. So based on what I've seen, I'm gonna do this. Yeah. Whereas if I had to guess what might I might see, I would maybe do something different and not be as efficient about it. So super super good. Um. Okay, so these last three, we're going to 10, 11, and 12. Uh, these are the last three of the colorless cards. We will talk about some cards in the colors. Um, they're all a little bit more spendy. I guess 12, not as much. It was hard to weigh, but I believe that these next two are, they're worth it. They go in, again, can basically go in every deck. And, yeah. and, and you know, I think they're around 40 bucks or so. Yeah, 20 to 30, I think, is where it's at uh, right now. This this first one we're going to talk about, the Sword of Feast and Famine, I think is around $30. It just hasn't been printed that many times. Um, and it's by far the best of the sword series. It's a three ma- All the swords are three-mana artifact equipments that equip for two and give your creature plus two, plus two, and then protection from a color. Two, uh, colors. two colors, usually yeah. based on the name. So Feast and Famine is green and black because Feast is green and famine is black protection from green and black uh, but more importantly they all have a second uh line of text that is relevant to those colors as well in this case it says whenever a quick creature deals combat damage to a player that player discards a card and you untap all lands you control wow that That's... second one is you kind of get two turns yeah well you get to play this and equip it oftentimes and then hit someone with it and then untap, untap and do a whole another turn after that yeah and so the almost the playing and the equipping is almost free often because of the protection from green and and black, you you very often can just find somebody that you get a free attack on because they can't block because they're yeah. one or both of those colors, and then immediately take a real turn. And so the sword kind of came out and was quote unquote free. Mm-hmm. Even then, sometimes you know you got ten or eleven lands. You're in green, maybe. Yeah, you're not necessarily in green. Sorry, I it lets you be a lot more uh, uh, like. You can just tap all your lands and play something if you know you're going to hit someone. The protection from black and green is so important. You can swing and hit so many people because of that. Yeah. yeah, this is, a, again, and even decks that aren't centered around, aren't Voltron, right? Aren't like, oh, my commander is going to swing at people. Yeah. Can play this card because, you know, I'll play it in like a, I don't know, 
what's a deck that like a Nekusar deck you would even think about it right uh-huh. just to get the extra mana even though swinging with Nekusar is not what that deck wants to do like that's not the prime strategy but you're gonna have that card out you might as well strap a sort of feast and famine and get a free swing and get you know seven eight extra mana in a turn or maybe two turns double up yeah yeah the it's so powerful it's it's very akin often to just take an extra turn. I mean, yeah. you don't get the card draw, but the amount of mana you get. Yeah, it's, again, like, and we say oftentimes you win the game when you're the first player to cast, like, four spells in a turn. And this is one of those cards that lets that happen. Yeah, good point. All right, uh, the next one you have to read because it's the most Jimmy Wong Game Nights card there yeah, is. Yeah, it's the way I die a lot of times. It's Ancient Tomb, everybody. Ho-ho, it's a land that you tap, adds colorless and colorless, so two mana total to your mana pool. And it does two damage to you. Doesn't come into play tapped. Has no other uh, downsides other than the fact that it shocks you every time you use it. But shockingly, being able to tap a land for two mana on as early as turn <laughs> one. one, it's pretty great. It's super powerful, and you have to consider that this card was balanced for one v one in a twenty life format. So yeah. in our format, you can almost consider that it's doing half damage. Yeah. Because we start with double life. It does add up, though. I will say that. So just be careful. <laughs> it totally adds up. Um, but it is an extreme advantage, especially for the decks that are non-green, I would say. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Green, I would still play this in a deck with green, though. I play this in basically every deck that I can. I only have so many of them, and I don't do the checklist thing. So, yep. you know, not all my decks can have one. But if they could, I would do it if I had that many. You want to buy um, some? <laughs> how many do you have? I probably have 16 of them at oh this point. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Yeah. Uh, so it goes. Okay. This last one's a little more conditional, but again, very, very good card. Yeah. So this is number 12, and it's Nykthos, Shrine to Nyx. It's a legendary land. You can only play one of it in your deck. <laughs> <laughs> Huge downside. You can tap it to add one to your mana pool, or you can tap two and then tap it. Choose a color, add to your mana pool, and the amount of mana of that color equal to your devotion of that color. And devotion is determined by how many permanents you have on the battlefield and the pip of that color. So in, for instance, if you had a card that was four white, white on the battlefield, that your devotion to white is two. Now, if you have other cards that have white pips and their mana symbols, your devotion is added up to that. But basically, if you have over three, uh, you can tap Nykthos for a positive gain in mana. Right. And there are a lot of decks, especially two and single color decks, where, you know, you're tapping two and Nykthos and getting seven or eight mana. Yeah. Which is huge game, right? Yeah, that's a plus four mana thing because you have to consider Nykthos can tap for one by itself and then two other lands that are tapping into it. So the fact that it taps for colorless mana on its own, yeah, makes it so that the downside is so small. I think if Nykthos didn't tap for mana on its own, even then, it's kind of Cabal Coffers esque. Yeah, not as good, but sometimes better because you need Urborg to really make Cabal Coffers good a lot of the time. Yes. Whereas Nykthos on its own, at least does something. I mean, obviously, you need a lot of pips out. Yeah, this, but some decks just have like mono black decks. A lot of red decks have a lot of like you need to have a lot of red to play these cards. And I've seen this card go off, especially if you can untap the land and do it again. Yep. Oof, craziness. Yeah, I uh, tapped it the other day and made sixteen mana, and then really? I untapped it and made sixteen more. It was great. What'd you do with that mana? Um, I think I cast like twelve different elves, and then <laughs> yeah, crater hoof or something. Nice. Tri- oh, I think it was trying for the hordes. Craig would be proud. Um. All right, so those are sort of the top 12. And I would get those 12 cards before I would get any of the next ones that we're about to talk about. There's one I would argue about. Okay. Um, <laughs> I know which one it is. And yeah, yeah it's possible. <laughs> Actually, two maybe on this but, list. But the 12 cards we just talked about can pretty much go in every deck. Nykthos yep. is the most um, or the least likely as far as like a three-color deck, depending on your color balance of permanence. Yeah. You might not use it. And again, there's decks like Mizzix or Spell, Kess, something like that, oh, that Kess, you yeah. don't have enough permanence to make Nykthos worth it. But all in all, you're usually going to be able to find a place where Nykthos is going to be good because you're just going to put enough permanence into play. All right, so now we're going to go into the colored cards. Uh, we're going to talk about just a couple of cards in each color, Yeah, sort of the top two cards. And you might be surprised by some of them, but well, we'll talk about that. Um, let's start with white. Yep, so Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshares are both of the one-mana instant spells in white that can exile a creature, and there's a side benefit for the opponent whenever that happens, whoever you target with it. Uh, you can do it to yourself as well, I think, with Path. I think as well for Swords. swords. Yeah. Um, Remember, for, Mel killed us by <laughs> yeah, Swords on your own creature. When you Path to Exile a creature, that uh, the creature's owner gets to search your library for a basic land card put on the battlefield tapped. So if you Swords a creature, you pay white in an instant, you exile target creature, its controller gains life equal to its power. But... For one mana, it's instant an instant. Instant speed. 
it's unbeatable in terms of like how efficient that removal is. And the downside really isn't that big of a deal. Life gain, especially not. Maybe the ramp is a slightly more dangerous, but honestly, getting rid of the most powerful creature on the board or the one that's going to kill you or the one that's causing the most chaos is 100% worth that cost. And it exiles. So yes. it even gets around, you know, the Carador decks and the Marin decks yes, and things absolutely. like that. It gets rid of the creature, quote unquote, for good. Of course, there are certain ways to get it back, but they have to jump through hoops. Um, I'd say normally when you exile something, you're you're in pretty good shape. Yeah. As far yeah, as having yeah. to see it again. Yeah. And they're just more efficient than anything anybody else has as far as any of the other colors. No, uh -huh. Nobody's got anything that's going to get rid of, you know, a creature for one mana at instant speed like that. Yeah, totally. Now, the next one was a little bit tough for me. And <laughs> I, I had sort of narrowed it down to two cards. Um, so I'll t I guess we may as well mention both. But the card that I would go with is Elspeth, Sun's Champion. And this is the only Planeswalker on our list. It's maybe the best... One of the best Planeswalkers, I think. I think it's the best Planeswalker probably in Commander. Yeah. Besides Teferi, if you make a Teferi deck. Um, or Ugin, I guess. Yeah, but in the 99, Ugin's a pretty good one. Ugin could easily have made our top 12 list. Yeah. It can go in any deck. Um, Elspeth, Sun's Champion, 4 White, White for a Planeswalker. I'm only going to talk about the first two abilities because they're the ones that matter. You can plus her. You can make three one one white soldier tokens. What? Make three creatures. For a six mana, you get four things essentially. And her negative allow uh, destroys all creatures power four or greater. So it's a board wipe. It's a little bit situational, but usually the creatures you really want to get rid of are big. Yeah, not to mention if you do this in conjunction with the first ability, your creatures stick around. Yeah. So the two abilities are so versatile in what you want them to do. Because you often want a board wipe, but sometimes you draw that board wipe and your board's great. Yeah. And you can, then can't play it. Well, she's still good in that situation because you just make three more tokens. And it's the kind of thing where like three tokens, three more tokens, your opponents can't let that go on for very long. Yeah. It's brutal in 1v1 and it's still pretty powerful in three player or four player. Because if you think about it, Let's say you need to block three different things coming at you to try and kill Elspeth. What do you get? Three 1-1 one, one tokens. You yep. know, very few cards can generate that many extra tokens just like that for free. Repeatedly. And Elspeth can repeatedly do it. Yeah. So, yeah, she's great. The other card in white that I considered instead of Elspeth was Land Tax. Right. Uh, because, it, because it is so unique. It's one white for an enchantment. And if any player has more lands than you during your upkeep, you can go find three basic lands from your deck and put them into your hand. So it kind of... Ancestral Recalls only for land every yeah. turn. Though. But it only works well in two-color decks and down, I think. Because once you get the three colors and above, your land tax will run out of things to find in two turns. At the same time, if it's still a one-mana card that drew you six cards. Pretty good. Especially if you have ways to use those cards, like loot them away and stuff yeah. like that. Um, the problem is, though, sometimes I've seen people play land tax and have to discard every turn. Yeah. So there, there's, yeah. there are some downsides. But I think the card is pretty good, but it's a little more li limited and situational. It's also a card where if you're playing in two colors there are sort of better ways to either draw cards or get your fixing. And yeah. you don't necessarily use land tax all the time uh, when paired with another color. So yeah. Yeah. Elspeth is still good. No matter whether other color you're pa paired with, she's going to you know, be great. All right. This is going to be one of the ones where you thought. Um, yep. hundred yeah. percent. Okay. So we're moving on to blue. Two cards in blue. Best bang for your buck. Number one is possibly the best card in the format besides Soul Ring. This is the one where you think... I think it's better than Soul Ring. <laughs> it's not better than Soul Ring. Come on. Okay, fine. <clears throat> it's better than Soul Ring. It's Cyclonic Rift. <laughs> one in the blue for an instant. You can either use it as that just to return target non-land permanent you don't control to its owner's hand. So just a bounce spell for one in the blue. Or <clears throat> it's most commonly used as Overload, six in the blue. You just change the text by replacing all instances of target with each. So return each... Non-land permanent, you don't control to its owner's hand for seven mana. That's an, It's a one-sided board clear. Instant speed. For every non-land permanent. So that's, it's not just creatures. It's not like a board wipe. It's not just artifacts. It's everything. It's enchantments, tokens, creatures, planeswalkers, artifacts, whatever you whatever you say. It's, it's going back to their hand. Except they for really should have made this card creatures. Yeah. It would be totally fine. It would still be good. It would still be great. You'd still play it. Yeah. But it wouldn't be so backbreaking. Um, it's an amazing card. Literally every blue deck should have this card in it. Literally every deck should be blue so you could play it. It is so it is so good that like if you don't have blue, that's the one of the things you miss the most. Probably the thing you miss the most. Is it's the thing I'm most afraid of, yeah. for sure. Every time. It's like, who has Cyclonic Rift? Yep, that's just going to hose me. And it's also, the bounce is actually makes it better. The fact that it returns it to hand. Yeah. 
Because you might have a deck that's playing like Face Reward or Boros Charm or some way to protect your board. But there's not really great ways. I can only think of really one to protect from Mass Bounce. Yeah. Because you can't make your stuff indestructible. You Teferi's can't make protection. it... Hex- yeah, Teferi's Protection is really the only way. That might be a, the card that we also missed in white. Just because it's... Yeah, I thought I about it. I haven't seen it played enough to really know yet. I but. think it's good. I don't think it's better than Path Swords and it's... Eh. It's, it might someday be better than Elspeth. Yeah. It's, I, I still think I'd rather... Ha- like I it, mean, Elspeth is nuts. Elspeth the versatility is, nuts, yeah. is out, out yeah. of control. Uh, but Cyclonic Rift is... Yeah, it's it's great. Um, and the second card in blue uh, I put was Ristic Study. Obviously. It's two and a blue <laughs> enchantment. Whenever an opponent casts a spell, you may draw a card unless that player pays one. This card's... I mean, it's just great. If you ever get it out on turn three, your chances of winning the game have to, like, double. Yeah. You're just, you're just draw drawing so, so many, many cards. Yeah. So now, many cards. It's not as good later because your opponents can kind of team up or, you know, they can negotiate. Listen, let's just all pay. And then yeah. that card did nothing. Even then, think of the mana tax you're applying to your opponents if they're just paying one extra for all their spells. There are cards yeah. that just do that. Yeah. That you would play in a deck. So even that's not that bad. And it's almost unheard of to not draw at least a couple of cards off of it, you know. They might keep up that unified front for like a rotation or two, but then something happens. You cast Cyclonic Rifter. Yeah, people need to dump their hands out again. Yeah, or discard. the board gets wiped, yeah. and like I'm going to have to be able to play two or three things just to get back in this game, and you're going to have to draw some cards. I'm going to have to risk risk it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this card is just... It's the card I probably most want to see in my opening hand. Yep, by far. In fact, when we were talking about it, I was thinking about like, oh, dream opening hands would be Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, Island, Ristic Study. You're just going to win a, you know, a lot of the games if you if you can play Ristic Study turn one or two. You're just or Mana or Vault, and then you can play a Signet too, and then by the time it gets back to you, you, you maybe you've drawn your yeah, hand you, again. Yeah, you dropped your whole hand on the table, but Ristic Study, you're going to draw. Yeah, yeah, you never know. Um, <laughs> I love Magical Christmas Land. Yeah, I mean that's I I definitely I wrote down here uh, why no counter spells because that's what we think of when we think of blue, uh-huh. and I think uh, I want to answer that question because Force of Will Mana Drain. You know, pack of negation, spell. even just regular counter spell. I think counter spell is like the second most played blue card after Cyclonic Rift. Here's the thing: there's a lot of alternatives for all of those that, like we just mentioned. So it's not as important that you go out and, you know, I think the bang for your buck is less. Yeah. Because you know, listen, dissolve's not the best card, but it only costs one more mana than counter spell. So if you have to run that, it's still like. 75 percent as good yeah and some and again some people don't want to play with counter spells yeah like, that's a gameplay thing but i think you should want to play with cyclonic rift <laughs> yeah some people don't want to play with cyclonic rift either yeah well those people <laughs> magic man sam I'd love probably to doesn't. play against those people so i don't have to be afraid of it <laughs> all right let's move on to black this is the other card that i thought might have been yeah yeah and that's demonic tutor it's just by far the best tutor in the game of magic the gathering i'm pretty sure it's one in the black for a sorcery search your library for any card put it in your hand that's um, it. No cost, so no, no cost. like pay life. Doesn't go on top of your deck. It is sorcery speed, sure. Uh, but the most important thing is that you can play this for two mana and then play that card or do other stuff in your turn. It doesn't like set you back so far like some of the other uh, tutors that put cards in your hand that cost four or five mana or whatever. So. Yeah, a lot of those cards, the other tutors like uh, Diabolic Tutor and things like that. You go get the card, but you you can't do it in the same turn. So you yeah. gotta you gotta wait a rotation of the table where everybody saw you just go get your best card. And speaking of versatility, no one knows what the card is. One single card being able to represent the other 98 cards in your deck is pretty powerful. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Now, this card is not cheap, but I believe that, you know, with the checklist system or whatever, having one of these will make, you know, won't just make one deck better. It can make, you know, five of your decks better, and and that makes it sort of worth it. Um, People that play more tutors usually end up winning more games, just flat out. (laughs) No, it's funny. I've said recently that one of the ways I've started to build my decks is with less tutors just because I find it more fun. Yeah. Um, So that's totally a a, a perspective that's out there that I share. But at the same time, objectively, Demonic Tutor will just make your deck more powerful. Yeah, without a doubt. Okay, the second card in black, best bang for your buck. It's kind of the Ristic Study of black. It's Phyrexian Arena. It's Mm -hmm. one black black for an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you draw a card and lose a life. So now you're drawing two cards per turn, losing a life for one of them. It's not as good as Ristic Study, obviously, uh, because you're only drawing one. Ristic Study is likely to draw you more. But at the same time... You're still drawing one. Guaranteed guaranteed value, low CMC, 
Yeah. I've seen people say like, oh, this is worse in Commander because your upkeep comes around so much later. You know, it's one in every four turns. And that's true. You do get to draw less quote unquote frequently because it's not every turn, every other turn, but you're still drawing more cards. And it's, but every time I'm losing in Commander, the one thing I want more of is cards. I'd say in Very my rarely is it life. In my black decks that don't have blue, this is probably the thing I tutor for early the most. Yeah. Or that I want to see in my hand the most. It's because if you get it out on turn three, your accumulated value over the next you know, our our games are likely to go eleven, twelve, thirteen turns. Uh huh. So that could be ten cards off this one card. I mean, obviously it can get removed and whatnot, but even just four or five cards for three mana is crazy. And the fact that you're getting that accumulated over time, it's not like I'm spending my seventh turn to get five cards i'm yeah. spending my third turn to get five six seven cards yeah and the Super. game will probably run a little longer if you're able to play us in turn three so all right on to red i had uh trouble deciding which of these should be in the first spot and which should be second i i, think I, I was pretty sure right. these were the top two but yeah. i didn't know no i think this is the right order um vandal blast is our first red card it's a red sorcery that costs one red mana you can destroy target artifact you don't control or similar to client grip you can overload it but this time for four in a red and so it says destroy each artifact you don't control for five mana that's good red i mean like there are a lot of like shatter storm-esque effects in red that blows up a lot of artifacts but you have to pay extra mana for each or it blows up your own yeah Five mana just to blow up every artifact that doesn't belong to you is extremely powerful. And this is the one thing that I've found sets people back super far in the game. Because so, have, and especially very powerful decks are are super often reliant on, you know, Mana Vault, Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, yeah. Grim Monolith, Basalt Monolith. They're, what they're trying to do is flood the board with a ton of mana very early and just do something before people are ready to react to it. And so the ability to blow up all their artifacts can just totally neuter those extremely powerful decks like like Cassius's yeah. decks yeah oh, they fold to vandal blast if you can ever resolve one because he has so many early artifacts in all of his decks that you know turn six oh all of a sudden you thought you had 15 mana available to you and you've got five well sometimes you'll keep a hand too that has two lands and a bunch of artifacts and you know you also cut your lands count down because you're playing so many mana ramp artifacts so yeah. vandal blast does have the ability to really get someone in that way uh and the second one is chaos warp this guy's gone down because of the tuck rule i think i still think it's really good and i put it i'll put it in multicolored decks very often because it's versatility it kind of falls into the utter end anguish on making category yeah. for me what's well, target permanent right? yeah not non-land just target permanent so pretty powerful yeah it's chaos warp it's two in a red uh okay let me read it the owner of target permanent shuffles it into his or her library then reveals the top card of his or her library. If it's a permanent card, he or she puts it onto the battlefield. So there's that minor downside. Let's not. We'll talk about that in a second. But Chaos Warp basically gets rid of any permanent instant speed in three red. Mana. Yeah, in red. It's very very important to say that red does not have the ability to deal with stuff like enchantments and a lot of other things. Uh, and like indestructibility is really hard for red sometimes too. So Chaos Warp pretty good. You do so. There is a random element to it. This is sort of the quote unquote chaos factor of it. And you put in one thing, get out another. In this case, it's like a human jumping in a, a becoming like a rhinoceros. A rhinoceros, or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they after you do that, they flip the top. So target a permanent, shuffle their library, shuffle it into their library, put their deck down. Then they just flip the top card. And if it's a permanent, it comes into play. Yeah, um, like when Craig flipped the Avenger of Zendikar. Yes, yeah. yes. That's kind of the worst that I've ever seen Chaos Warp do. I mean, something like... The worst like, I've seen is when it flips the same card over, which I've never actually seen twice that. now. Yeah, that's crazy. Let's say you have 36 lands, 37 lands. That uh -huh. means you have about a 36, 37% chance, more than one in three chance of it just being a land. Yeah, which is great. Then if it's an instant sorcery or non-permanent card, that's just going to stay on the top of their library, right? It only comes into play if it's a permanent. Yeah, you reveal right? the top card, yeah. Yeah. Then how many of them are just like a signet, or whatever like your your percentage chance of the card being very bad for you it's like 50 50 i don't in terms of that. in terms I, of having a permanent that's like legitimate to flip otherwise yeah. it's a land or a source it's probably 50 50 that it could even be a permanent and then from that point how many of their permanents are worse than the one you're getting rid of you know like i said a lot of them are going to be like a signet a thought yeah. vessel or something where you're like that's great that's fine i'm totally not worried about that you know it's there's probably only like you know 10 11 12 percent of their deck that's really cards that are really bad like because yeah. what are you getting rid of you're getting rid of one of the worst cards in, for you right now yeah w yeah what are the chances that a random card off the top of their deck is better um yeah it's like 50 50 it being something that is potentially relevant 
and then like 10% of it actually being relevant. Because yeah. like if it's a land, whatever. Like if it's an instant or sorcery, great. It's such a great card because it's so red, right? Yeah, it's well, like, that's I'll the thing. A, Mark doesn't. Mark Rosewire thinks this is not the right way to do chaos in red. But this is like it gives red the ability to deal with some things. And I don't think they should print 15 of these cards. Yeah. But I like red having like, listen, you get an enchantment. At least I have something that can do something about it. But at the same time, I could make the situation worse. It's yeah. a, There's a chance. It's a low yeah, chance, it's but true. it's possible. All right, on to green, our final color. Um, the first card in green, if you don't have this card, you need to get it. Yep. It's. I think it's the most played green card according to EDH Rec. Wouldn't surprise me. I mean, the price One, of it, too, is like it's all like slowly been rising over time. They're all like five bucks and up now. Man, it just it's got crazy. reprinted, didn't it? it got, it's been reprinted one, two, three, four, five, six, six times with a Friday Night Magic special. Wow. Uh, it's Eternal so. Witness. Ewit, one of the staples of the format. It Amazing is one too. green green for a 2-1. And when it enters the battlefield, you can return a card from your graveyard to your hand. So it regrowths something on a creature. Listen, it's good if you can flicker it, if you can clone it, if you can bounce it to your hand, uh, reanimate it from it, your yeah. library. You know, you get multiple uses. That's why it's so good. It's also just good if you just get a card back with it and don't ever use it again. Yeah. Because I mean, it's also a creature at the end of the day. Like, Regrowth is another card that a lot of people play that returns a card from your graveyard to your hand. Yep. But this gives you a creature, and yep. you can flicker it, and you can reuse it. So, Charles Witness is just absolutely important. I mean, we're in a singleton format. So, the whole format is kind of built around the fact that I can only use my cards ostensibly one time. Eternal yeah. Witness lets you cast Cyclonic Rift again, cast Demonic Tutor again, cast oh, Chaos Warp again. <laughs> they got rid of Heuristic Study. You recast it. Path, to, Path or Swords again. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, and then I, I cheated a little again for the number two spot in green. Green was, I'll you. tell you what, green was the hardest color to do. There are a lot of cards in green that you can make a case for, yeah. you know. But I believe this package of cards is... Again, we have to answer Terry's question, right? What cards should I buy if I want to build the decks? Right. And Terry, if there are a lot of choices, but I would say the, this next one is what you should get. It's really... It's all the ramp. It's, it's the land-based sorcery speed ramp. Mm -hmm. So Cultivate, Kodama's Reach. Those are the three mana cost ones. Ramp and Growth, Farseek are the two mana cost ones. They're not expensive cards. I would get all four to have in my... If you don't if you have a commander collection or you're building commander decks and you don't have those four cards, uh, you need to go get them right now. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons these are good. And that's why we kept saying earlier, like, get the Signets. Eh, but you don't necessarily need the green ones. Because green has rampant growth and Farseek. And it's much more protected because they're getting lands onto the battlefield. That's and... really, I think, the big thing about yeah. this. It, is that the format, for right or wrong, for whatever reason, the way that the format has sort of socially been constructed is that mass land destruction is generally frowned upon. Especially mm -hmm. mass, like, basic land destruction. Yeah, totally. You know, Blood Moon, some people, you know, I hate it, but some people will play that kind of thing or things that get rid of you know, um, non-basic lands. But your basic lands are, most games, safe as a whole. Yep. And so if you're playing cards that are putting more basic lands into play, you're going to just have an advantage that's kind of untouchable. Yeah, not to mention pairs really well with Sword of the Feast of Famine and other mana doublers in green, like Mirari's Wake or uh, Zendikar Resurgent. You know, there are a lot of different w reasons that having extra lands is better than having a lot of mana base ramp. You're not as explosive necessarily, but you're a lot more is in the green way. You endure the game a lot longer. Your, your endurance is good. Yeah. I would say that if you ever have the choice between artifact-based or creature-based, you know, Birds of Paradise uh -huh. versus a Signet versus Farseek, you always want the land. Yeah, it's it would just, go land artifact creature. Yeah, it's just the safest. So... Um, I mean, if all things are equal, obviously Birds of Paradise is one mana, so yep. it's it's another contender for a staple. But even though it's overrated, okay, it can block flyers. I right. wanted to talk about two multicolored cards. Even though I would say I wouldn't recommend getting a multicolored card as sort of best bang for your buck, because not only do you have to be in one of the colors, you have to be in two specific colors. It's just going to go in the lower percentage of your of your decks. And right? this first one also requires you need to play a creature based deck yeah which most are most decks are I think, it's but. so powerful i would think about it but i wouldn't tell terry to go get this card right now i think that's later on when your commander collection is a little bit bigger mm -hmm. then you would go pick up these two cards um both of them have white in them the first one is aura shards one green and white for an enchantment 
Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, you may destroy target, artifact, or enchantment. What? <sighs> this card Anytime is really good. Enters the battlefield. <laughs> Token decks? This is just... This is just uh, Vandal Blast and Enchantment Blast all in one. Yeah, when people see this card come down, that's the biggest groans they usually hear at the table, being like, oh, what? Yep. I can't play this. They look at their hands. They realize they can't play anything in it because it's just going to get targeted by Aura Shards. And they're not going to have half their board by the time it comes to their turn now. Yeah. Um, this definitely does not make you any friends, but it is so, so good. I've never played this card and been like, what a waste. Oh, yeah. It's impossible because there's so many players. There's always artifacts and enchantments. It let me ask you a question. If this card just said one or the other, it would still be good, right? Oh, destroy target artifact or destroy target enchantment? Yeah, but it didn't. 100%. Yeah. But it does both. Yeah. It's crazy. It is crazy. Um, it's incredibly powerful and price-wise not as high as as you might expect. Yeah, it's a little spendy. It's not like a, a $1 card, but it's not ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. But again, if you don't have the other cards on this list, at least the, the colorless cards, um, I would be a little hesitant to pick this up right away just because you're really locking yourself into a color combination. And almost a dark deck archetype in a way. Yeah. Needing to put out creatures. Because if you just play one creature a turn and blow up one thing, it's fine, but you're going to... It's not going to be as effective because with this kind of card, you want to blow up all the things that are going to hurt you because you're not going to make any friends. Yep. So the faster you can do that, the more you know crippled you can make your opponents, the better. And the second card under multicolored is Supreme Verdict. This is the uncounterable board wipe. Yeah, one blue, blue, white. Yep. Uh, one all, white, white, blue. Sorry. One white, white, blue. Destroy all creatures uh, can't be countered. However, it doesn't have the they can't be regenerated thing. Which so they can be regenerated. Which almost never it comes very into play. Rarely yeah. <laughs> yeah. It just the ability to board wipe knowing it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. I mean, when you have Supreme Verdict, you feel really good because... Uh, Wrath of God's great, Toxic Deluge is great, but there's always that chance like somebody will stop it. Yeah. Supreme Verdict is just like, well, this is going to happen. Deal with it. Yeah. All right, I have uh, three honorable mentions before we wrap up here. Oh, These you are... know, Supreme Verdict can be ventured, though. It can be bounced back to its hand. That's true. Can't be countered, though. That's true. Um... All right, honorable mentions. <laughs> all right. The honorable mentions are all sort of more expensive than the other ones. And I would consider them based on what you've got to be able to, for trade or what your budget is, but I think they're below all the other colorless cards we mentioned before. Um, one is Mana Crypt. Mm -hmm. Recently reprinted a couple of times, so the price has come down to more reasonable levels. Yeah, definitely more reasonable, but still not cheap by any means. Yeah, it's a zero-cost artifact. It taps for two colorless mana, and then at the beginning of your upkeep at the flip a coin you flip a coin and um you either take three damage or you take zero damage depending on the flip but it costs zero mana to cast it's a soul ring yeah it's a second soul ring soul rings the best card <clears throat> in the format so to have two of them it's actually often better than a soul ring because it costs zero and like you said you can risk study on turn one with it potentially you can't really do that with soul ring uh depending obviously yeah um and it'll lightning bolt you 50 percent of the time but it, they run you like a hundred bucks or so. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not cheap. Yeah. It, it is clearly a very powerful card. Anything that says zero in the casting cost and can do something like this, oh, absurd. I, it's a checklist card for sure. Whereas if you had yes, one totally. and you checklisted it, it'd be great. And if you have like, how many commander decks would you have before that's worth it? Maybe five, six, I think. Um, and that the, the amount of power level that it's giving to all your decks by having one in your collection is so high. Is very high because it's a second soul ring, and like we said, even better. Um, all right, the next one is Gaia's Cradle. This one may be a little bit less now because Growing Rights of Itlamok has come out. Yep, which is a quote unquote functional reprint of Gaia's Cradle because when it flips over, it does pretty much the exact same thing, but it also taps for land for, for, for green, for, even for if you have green, no creature. Yeah. So, Gaia's Cradle is a land, a legendary <clears throat> land. You tap it to add green to your mana pool for each creature you control. This is probably the best land in the format as far as most powerful most explosive it's gonna run you 250 bucks approximately it's on the reserve list so <laughs> it's only gonna go up and up yeah it's it's very very good i think though i might be wrong here actually with growing yeah. rights out that might be fine just get growing rights of Lamak, and it's probably not worth the price point you'd have to have a lot of green based creature decks before it'd really be worth it to pick one of these up yeah um I mean, Growing Rights is an excellent substitution. It's way cheaper, and it actually does something when it comes to the battlefield. It helps search for more creatures. It's and really, more... like, if you don't have four creatures, at least, then Guy's Cradle is not that good anyway. Yeah, tap for two, three mana or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
but it's it is really good. It's a yeah. really good card. It's one of those cards that if it sticks around for two or three turns, it's, uh, your chances to win the game are very high. GG. All right, and the last one is a pairing. It's Cabal Coffers and Urborg. So Urborg turns all lands into swamps in addition to their other types. And then Cabal Coffers, you pay two and tap it, and you get mana equal to the number of swamps that you control. Um, basically, if your deck is black, it probably has this. I mean, five color, four color, maybe not, but... It's a very low cost to you as well. I mean, Urborg also fixes you in a lot of ways. Very rarely have I seen Urborg really benefit an opponent more so than it does me. Very rarely. Yeah, it's happened, but but, but rarely. And you usually pair it with like Expedition Map, so you can mm-hmm. go find the other one when that happens. It's also a lot of ramp in black, you know, and especially like black or black white or black red, they have trouble with ramp. So this is a sort of a setup that you find yourself putting in a lot of decks. Yeah. Yeah. So I would consider those three. Um, again, I would go to the 12 uh, original cards we mentioned um, as sort of the baseline. Really the first, like, I don't know, what is that, seven, eight, before yeah. you get to um, fetch lands. Fetch lands, it starts getting a little expensive. But those first ones are not incredibly expensive. Not and if you, your commander collection will be just way improved by filling in the blanks that you don't have in, in those first, like, eight or nine. In fact, I'm going to find the paper and read it real quick. That didn't take long. So number one was Sensei's Divining Top. Number two is Strip Mine. Three, Solemn Simulacrum. Four, Lightning Greaves. Five, Maze of Ith. Six, the Shock Lands. You could also consider the Have Lands or the Amonkhet Cycle Lands. Seven is Felwar Stone and the Signets. Um, those, I think, are the most important. Terry, those yeah. are what you should pick up first of all. And then you can move on to the Fetch Lands, Vidalcan Orrery, Sword of Feast and Famine, Ancient Tomb, and Nykthos. All right. I'd put Vidalcan Orrery a little higher, honestly. Really? Yeah, I mean, why not? It's not super expensive, uh, the non-foil versions, right? So yeah. you could move it up there, bang for your buck wise. Might be good. I got to throw that paper twice. That was lucky awesome. Lucky you. Lucky you. Um, I also have an expanded list of this. Like the way that we sort of do the show is come up with a topic and then we just type in a whole bunch of cards and you end up with this list. It's like, um, way too long. We can't yeah. talk about 300 cards in an episode. We just, that will take forever. And Craig and Terry will be pulling their hair out, trying to put all those cards on screen. So what I did is I kept those lists around. And if you're a patron of the show, you'll be able to access uh, the full list of all this, the other staples that maybe didn't quite make the cut, but they're still cards I would consider to expand your collection. If you don't already have them. Yes. Join the Patreon, please. All right. To the listeners. What cards do you think are the absolute must-haves in the format that should, we should have talked about above cards that we did talk about? So yeah. are, do you sort of disagree with anything we said? Yeah, do you think in the multicolored we should have included something like Josh's favorite, like Anguish Unmaking, you know, those kinds of cards? Anguished, Utter End, and Vindicate were a, a grouping that I thought about yeah. in there. So yeah, definitely hit us up. We are sure that we've missed some stuff. Of course, if you're a patron and have seen the expanded list, then you'll know that maybe those cards are on that list as well. If you're not a patron, go ahead and leave a comment on this video. Tweet at us, put a comment on Facebook, wherever you want, get at us. Yeah, I do like the comments on YouTube because anybody watching could go and scroll through and see mm-hmm. other alternatives that other experienced commander players are sort of suggesting to them uh, to help expand their commission, their collection efficiently. All right. If you want to pick up any of these cards, especially those top seven that we were talking about, please go to cardkingdom.com slash command zone and use that affiliate link when you order them because you will be simultaneously getting the cards that are going to most efficiently expand your collection and Shipped help you make... efficiently too. Yeah. And you'll be supporting the command zone and game nights and all of our content. So you can... That's what we call a two for one. That's what we call value. That is a good two for one for yeah, sure. That's a good one. Also, make sure to pick up Ultra Pro product at your next most convenient time. Uh, again, they just came out the Relic token series. Really cool little tokens that you can put on top of regular tokens. They have little counters on them. They have little Tarmogoyf ones for all you modern players out there or the crazy people that played in EDH. There is a lot of good stuff from Ultra Pro. You can find it at any LGS, pretty much, uh, big box retailers, too, and as well as your local uh, cardkingdom.com slash commands on the affiliate link. <laughs> <laughs> it's always local because it's on the yeah, internet. Yeah, exactly. Now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. Um, we talked about a movie last week, and there's a movie this week that I'm kind of excited to check out. Oh? It's Annihilation. Have you seen it? Oh, the- Yeah. Yeah. It's the director of Ex Machina, one of my favorite sci-fi movies I think I've ever seen. Yeah, that's exactly why I'm excited about it too because yeah. I loved Ex Machina. It was such it was just a great movie, very Incredible simple. Movie. Yeah. So I'm really excited to see what 
you know, the second outing is. Yep. And so it's got Nat- Natalie Portman. A bunch of lady scientists going out into the wild doing cool stuff. And it looks very cerebral, sci-fi, kind of like Ex, Mach- Ex Machina, kind of mm-hmm. like uh, Arrival kind of a little bit. Yeah, that's what it reminded me of. Yeah. And I mean, Oscar- that's what it looks like. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, Oscar Isaac also uh, makes a return. I think it's the first in a three-book series, actually. Annihilation is the name of the book, and there are two more books after that. So I think if the movie does well, they're going to make the other two movies as well. Sweet. That means after I see the movie, if I like it, I can then read the books, wow. which is even better. That's, yeah. like, again, value. So Mad value. Yeah. By the time you're watching this, the movie will have already come out, so maybe you've seen it. Uh, let us know if you liked it or not. Hopefully, I've seen it as well. I hope it's good. Yeah. I hope it, looks, right. it looks really cool from the trailers, at least. Um, one thing I wanted to say, if you're still here, and this should teach you a lesson that you should watch the video all the way to the end because you might get something, uh, some information that yeah, you don't, want. Yeah, don't just click those time codes in the comments. You know there's good stuff everywhere. It does matter, I think, to YouTube if you watch the entirety of the video, right? Like yeah, the, the uh, amount of minutes watched matters. But there is actually some actual information here that you might want to know, which is that our Game Nights audition officially... The deadline for entering has already passed by the time you're watching this, probably. It was noon Pacific Standard Time on February 28th. However, because we did not have a podcast episode last week, so we didn't get a chance to warn you of that, we're going to increase the deadline by one day. Uno day. So that means on March 1st at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time, if you haven't submitted your audition video to be a guest on Game Nights by then you won't be qualified. However, if you're watching this and the deadline hasn't passed, go grab your cell phone, grab your camera, whatever you got. Just record a quick audition. It can be, we said three minutes or less. That means that it can be less than three minutes. You can just Mm -hmm. do it in 60 seconds really quick. Talk about your favorite deck. I want to say a couple of things. One is the deck you talk about on your audition doesn't matter as much. It's not necessarily going to be the deck you're playing on the show. It's just a way to give structure to the audition, give you something to talk about. And, you know, specifically, we want to hear you talk about magic. But the most important thing is that you're passionate, you're excited, you're happy, you seem like you're good on camera. The second thing is we're only offering the airfare to the guests chosen if they're a resident of the United States. However, you can enter if you're from outside the U.S., you just have to be willing, if you're chosen, to provide for your own air travel. That's it. It's just a bunch, there's a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo when you do stuff and we just have to follow the rules. So yep. that's the reasoning for that. Again, if you're watching this and it's before March 1st at noon Pacific, you have time. Send us a link to your U- your audition on YouTube um, and good luck. Good luck. We hope to see you on game nights. You know what else <laughs> is a show? Who has been on game nights? One of them. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Alex Kessler yeah. from the Masters of Modern Podcast, our sister podcast, along with his co-host, Ben Bateman. They talk about the modern format, which definitely had a huge shakeup lately because Blood Braid Elf, Jason the Mind Sculptor, unbanned. Wow. It's crazy. I want to play modern now and it's just crazy. And resolve Blood Braid Elves. I saw Cassius was building a... Uh, he was building Jace, a Jund deck. Yeah. Oh, he, he built both. He built oh. Jund because of Blood Braid, <laughs> and he's like, Jason Blood Braid? I'm building both those decks. Um, Perfect. Yeah. So if you want to hear all the ins and outs of what that huge ripples through the format that it's going to cause the masters of modern podcast is the place to go alex and ben will tell you all about it i'm sure you can find them at the mm cast on twitter or right next to us at collected.company yep and our editors plural for the show are craig blanchett and terry robertson so big thanks to them as always for taking care of the show you can make sure to watch the video versions that they put together lovingly at youtube.com slash the command zone podcast and it's opened and closed by Awesome Animations by Jeffrey Palmer. You can find him on Twitter at LivingCardsMTG. It's been a pleasure working with everyone uh, for these past two, three years. And we hope to continue that forever. Forever? Forever, ever? And that's Jimmy Wong signing off forever. I leave you, Josh, with the show. Peace. Good luck. <laughs> Bye. For your attention. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>